Settle down. Okay. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thanks, everyone, for coming. It's great to see a really good turnout, um, especially this very strange weather. Um, I've not experienced something like this in terms of temperature change. So, um, and I realise the room is quite hot. So, thanks very much, everyone, for for sort of the patience and being here. Um, this is the panel public forum discussion titled Revolutionary Strategy and Neo-Social Democracy, a Transatlantic Dialogue, hosted by Platypus. Um, before I introduce the speakers, I'm just going to say the customary few words about Platypus for those who don't know. So the Platypus Affiliated Society, established in 2006, organizes reading groups, public fora, research and journalism focused on problems and tasks inherited from the old left, that being the 1920s to 30s, the new left, 1960s to 70s, and the post-political left, 1980s to 90s, for the possibilities of emancipatory politics today. You can learn more about our activities or find a local chapter to you by visiting our website, which is platypus1917.org, or by emailing platypusvirtual at gmail.com. And for those of you who are local, the Chicago Chapters Reading Group is held on Sundays at Harper 135, 12 to 3. And coffee breaks on Wednesdays in Hutchinson Commons, 4.30 to 5.30. And if you're interested, then please contact platypus.chicago at gmail.com. Um, I'm going to read the panel description that we circulated to the panelists, which is online. And then I'll introduce the speakers. Again, the title of this panel is Revolutionary Strategy and Neo-Social Democracy, a Transatlantic Dialogue. The collapse of the Occupy movement, the Arab Spring, and the anti-austerity protests of the 21st century's first decade offered the millennial left an opportunity to reconsider the perennial issue of left leadership. But caught between the twin poles of electoralism and base building, or the ballots and the streets, the millennial left has avoided an adequate confrontation with the question at the heart of leadership, that being the, quote, political party question. Often using efforts like Mike McNair's book, Revolutionary Strategy, from 2008 as a guide, thought leaders of the millennial left, like Bhaskar Sankara and Vivek Chiba, turned in the pages of Jacobin and Catalyst, respectively, to the legacy of the second international Marxism, the principles of political party organization, from which sprang forth a revival of interest in social democracy, or more commonly shorthanded as neo kautskyanism Late millennial expressions of this phenomenon, like Cosmonaut magazine, groupings affiliated with the Marxist Center and the DSA Caucus Marxist Unity Group, all self-identified as neo kautskyan and McNairite. But it remains unclear what all these tendencies have in common and where they diverge. In this workshop, Platypus asks one representative from the CPGB and one from the Marxist Unity Group to pursue these questions by exploring their respective organizational histories. Why return to the deep history of social democracy in the present? What is a socialist party? What are the greatest obstacles today to the realization of the socialist party? How can those obstacles be met? Presentations from each speaker will then be followed by an open question and answer, and I encourage everyone to think of questions as from early as possible. Um, so now I'm just going to introduce the bios and then we'll get started. Um, there's been a slight adjustment to the order, so um, I'm gonna, we're going to start with Matthew Strupp on my left here. Matthew is an editor at Cosmonaut magazine, a member of the Marxist Unity Group Central Committee, and is active in the Madison Area Democratic Socialists of America, or DSA. And then further to my left is Mike McNair, who is a retired professor of law at University of Oxford, where he authored numerous works on 17th and 18th century English legal theory. McNair is also a member of the Provisional Central Committee of the Communist Party of Great Britain, or the CPGB, and author of Revolutionary Strategy, Marxism and the Challenge of Left Unity from 2008. And my name is David Mountain. I'm uh, from the Manchester chapter of the Platypus Affiliated Society in Britain. Uh, without further ado, I'm gonna, we're going to get started, uh, starting with Matthew. Uh, over to you. Yeah, thanks for that. And uh, thank you to Platypus for putting together this uh, 
panel, this discussion, uh, Mike's book, Revolutionary Strategy, his work in general, um, the sort of theoretical output of the CPGB has been a big political, political influence on myself and everybody involved in Marxist Unity Group. Um, so in, in trying to respond to um, sort of what's being posed in this, uh, in this discussion, you know, I'll start out by trying to answer the first question uh, posed in the description. Why return to the deep history of second international social democracy to inform 21st century communist politics? Uh, the first point that can be made is that the history of the second international has been, until recently, steeped in so many myths and distortions suited to 20th, uh, 20th century political practice that as purely an intellectual or a historical endeavor, there are volumes upon volumes of fruitful materials from the history of our movement that have not been subjected to critical scrutiny and placed into the context of the movement's whole history. So studying the debates, practices, and politics of the Second International, an organization that included millions of workers across continents, organized into parties that were at least vow avowedly Marxist and revolutionary, is a matter of filling in a massive blank in the history of our movement. The second reason is that in the 21st century, after the fall of both the bureaucratic socialist states and the reformist welfare state, the two main alternatives to the mass Marxist party model of the Second International, that of the party of a new type, characterized by a militarized monolithic party organization, and unity around theoretical agreement with correct doctrine, and, and the other option, which is the reformist party of government that's willing to come to power under the existing state regime, neither of those can really uh, claim that the proof is in the pudding for themselves anymore. Uh, their models and their political strategies failed at least as badly as the Second International did. There are certain features of the Second International's party model that make it desirable relative to these two 20th century alternatives. In relation to the party of a new type uh, promoted by the so-called Leninist organizations, the idea of a party united around acceptance of a definite political program for working class rule with freedom to organize to change the policy of the party avoids at least some of the tendency toward constant splits among the confessional sects of the far left. If members believe that through strong arguments and organizing effort, they can change the policy of the organization once they convince most of the people in it, they're much less likely to see it as vital to start a new organization to pursue their policy. In relation to reformist organizations, the strategy of patient opposition pursued by the uh, parties of the Second International and the rejection of ministerialism, taking responsibility for executive government without implementing a program to change the state form to bring the working class to power, um, avoids the problem uh, faced by left reformist parties such as Syriza and now Podemos, as well as the mainstream social democratic parties to their right of going into government within the present constitutional framework and being forced to carry out attacks on the working class. Instead, the parties of the Second International had a concept of a minimum program, an essential set of demands for working class rule that were their minimum conditions for taking responsibility for government. The core of the minimum program was a set of radically democratic political demands posed against the liberal constitutional capitalist state regime. In the program of the Socialist Party of America, this included the abolition of the Senate, the Supreme Court's right of judicial review, and the Electoral College, as well as the calling of a convention for the revision of the Constitution. The Erfurt program and the programs of the Russian and Austrian Social Democrats all included abolition of the Standing Army and its replacement by a people's militia. The founders of Jacobin Magazine, as mentioned in the uh, introduction to the session, were and are, no doubt, drawn to aspects of this history and strategy. If you look on Goodreads for Mike's book, Revolutionary Strategy, you'll find a five-star review from Bhaskar Sankar in 2010. <laughs> However, they were never really committed to the full political strategy of building an intransigent Marxist opposition party, and have generally argued that 1970s Swedish social democracy and the popular unity government in Chile offer equally relevant models uh, to that of revolutionary second international social democracy. They insist that socialism only comes to the political horizon after the reachievement of the reformist social democratic welfare state. This is based on an economistic premise that a proletarian majority in society can only be won to the idea of working class rule and socialism after socialists have already taken power within the existing state regime and made material gains for the working class. Eric Blanc made this case quite explicitly in a debate on the strategic lessons of revolutionary social democracy with Ben Lewis and Gil Schaefer, hosted by Cosmonaut Magazine in 2021. 
And Chris Maizano has an article in the latest issue of Socialist Forum, DSA's theoretical publication, arguing that socialists must be a party of government as well as a party of opposition. And he explicitly argues against the anti-ministerialism of the Second International. In the US context, this has also led them to backtrack some of their initial opposition to the undemocratic US constitutional order. Seth Ackerman's 2011 article, Burn the Constitution, was a sharp revolutionary democratic indictment of the oligarchic and politically fragmentary nature of the US Constitution. As Gil Schaefer pointed out in his 2020 article for Cosmonaut, Lenin and the Class Point of View, by 2018, core Jacobin writers like Chris Maizano in his article, The Constitution and the Class Struggle, were arguing that demanding a new constitution would be, quote, utopian. Presumably, this applies to burning the current one, too, like Ackerman argued, since it would be even more utopian and anarchist to burn it without demanding anything new. This follows from the Jacobin milieu's general acceptance of reformism and class collaborationism, since calling for a new constitution is calling for a revolution against the current one, and is therefore inca incompatible with the idea that one must enter government within the existing state order before winning a working class majority to revolutionary ideas. As I indicated earlier, it's precisely the example of mass Marxist opposition parties and the emphasis on the revolutionary struggle for political democracy that make the history of the Second International appealing to Cosmonaut Magazine and the Marxist Unity Group. Cosmonaut was founded in 2018 by a handful of US readers and sympathizers of the Weekly Worker and the CPGB, along with some others who wanted to participate in creating a non-dogmatic, movement-oriented rather than academic, communist theoretical publication. It was an open theoretical project meant to stimulate independent communist historical research and political theoretical discussion and lay the groundwork for Marxist political activity on a higher level than that of the sects or the dominant reformist politics of DSA, with the core politics meant to be those of the weekly worker. Our editor-in-chief Donald Parkinson referred to it once as Jacobin for communists. I think it's been pretty successful in that purpose, and it's hosted a number of very enriching debates in its pages. It's helped to promote, I think, a culture of non-dogmatic, but theoretically and historically informed discussion within the US socialist movement. And it has quite a, uh, an extensive podcast archive with, with great interviews with Marxist scholars and activists on a wide variety of topics. However, as an independent magazine, Cosmonaut had limits when it came to direct political engagement with the organizations of the socialist movement. It hosted a lot of articles on important political questions in organizations like DSA, the Marxist Center, and CPUSA, but it wasn't able to play the role of a political organization itself to structure activity within any one of these formations. As champions of politics first Marxism, as our views were described at last year's Platypus Convention, almost, any, almost everyone involved in Cosmonaut wanted to be engaged in the project of fighting for a genuine communist party in this country. However, there were different views on how to pursue that project. Some people involved in Cosmonaut shared the economistic base building ideology of the Marxist Center organization, which held that an organized working class base had to be built before socialist politics would ever be relevant. This isn't so far from the ideas of certain parts of DSA, like the Bread and Roses Caucus, except that Marxist Center tended to be more dual unionist, focusing on organizing unorganized workers into new unions, rather than fighting within the existing ones, and building tenant unions that were oriented to communist politics from the beginning. This was an almost syndicalist idea that, because, that there wasn't the basis for a mass communist party, but that existing trade unions were insufficient because they weren't acting enough like a communist party. So communists needed to organize new unions that would function like a party without actually trying to found one on a clear programmatic basis. This approach hasn't borne much fruit. The projects like Amazonians United and the Autonomous Tenant Union Network that Marxist Center members were involved in have survived the demise of that organization. The other point of view within Cosmonaut was represented by those who are more attached to the ideas of the CPGB and the Weekly Worker from the beginning. We thought and think that an effective merger of socialism and the workers' movement could only occur at a meaningful scale once Marxists had united themselves into a common organization, a mass communist party with a clear program for working class rule that could structure a unity and action for all communists and would be organized on principles of genuine democratic centralism meaning with rights of members to criticize its policy, program, and tactics publicly, and organize factions to change them. This is because organize, uh, achieving um, the principled unity of Marxists on the basis of a clear strategic outlook produces a snowball effect that can transform what were previously small organizations whose combined membership doesn't add up to much into potentially a mass party of the class. This can be seen in the 1875 Gotha merger in Germany, where the combined membership of the Lasallian ADAV and the Marxist SDAP was under 20,000.
But after unity was achieved, the force of attraction of the United Social Democratic Party allowed it to become a party of a million members over the course of the following decades. Similarly, in the United States, the organizations that merged to form the Socialist Party had only 4,000 members at its founding convention in 1901, but it was able to grow to over 100,000 members by 1912. Neither the SPD or the Socialist Party of America did this on the basis of tepid, lowest common denominator reform programs, but on fairly strong socialist foundations. In the case of the SPD, the politics sharpened over the first few decades, with the Gotha program being replaced by the Marxist Erfurt program in 1891. Winning self-identified Marxists to our, to our ideas of radical democracy and society and a genuinely democratic centralist mass communist party meant that we had to go into and bring these ideas to bear on the organizations in which Marxists were already active. The various sects with their bureaucratic controls on free speech would be difficult to organize within. And there was no real reason to choose any one of the half dozen larger ones over any of the others. They could generally be externally engaged with through Cosmonaut. This was also before the recent membership growth of the Communist Party USA, which just looked like another one of the sects, except committed to an extreme form of class collaborationism and tailism of the Democratic Party. DSA, however, had exploded in membership since the Ber first Bernie Sanders campaign in 2016. And this included both people who were newly being introduced to socialist politics and thousands of people who had previously been scattered across dozens of fragmented Marxist organizations. At its 2017 convention, DSA signaled that it was no longer the Harringtonite Democratic Party lobbying group it had been for 40 years, when it dramatically exited the Socialist International due to the neoliberalism and establishment character of its main parties. And while DSA had previously been one of the only organizations on the US left tolerant of Zionism, in 2017 it declared its support for the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement against Israel. The break with Harringtonism meant that the future direction of the organization was somewhat up in the air, because nothing as coherent as its founding ideology had yet replaced it, and a variety of factions generally called caucuses have sprung up. The pro-political wing of Cosmonaut decided that forming our own faction in DSA to fight for principled Marxist politics was the best way to advance our party project and promote our strategic ideas among those who had been drawn to the socialist movement in this country. And that faction is called the Marxist Unity Group. Our priorities in DSA at the moment are around promoting genuine democratic centralism in the organization to combat both the bureaucratic tendencies exhibited by the leadership and the way that members elected to public office have been able to reverse in practice the principled positions the organization has sometimes adopted and advocates for on paper. We also want to enhance the culture of democratic debate in DSA, which means building a vibrant organizational press. A special focus at present is fighting against social imperialism and the capitulation of DSA's members in Congress to militarism in the form of their support for the US imperialist proxy war in Ukraine. These are the main topics of the proposals we're attempting to advance at this summer's DSA convention. At the moment, I believe that the most important ground in the struggle for a Marxist party is the struggle against class collaborationism in DSA as a large organization whose future is politically contested. It could very well be the case that the partyist elements lose that battle, that DSA expels its left-wingers and adopts an internal police regime to keep communists from openly advocating their views, or that it experiences a dramatic decline in membership as its democratic party tailism breeds disillusionment. If that occurs, the task of, Mar of united Marxists in a democratically organized party based on a program for working class rule for thr through radical democracy in state and society and a break with the capitalist constitutional order will remain, the form of pursuing it will simply have changed. Perhaps the elements expelled from DSA will need to organize and politically clarify themselves. Maybe a struggle will need, be, need to be waged within the Communist Party USA, where some of the focus of newly radicalized young people has shifted or the task might be directly appealing to the members of the various fragmented Marxist organizations. These are all more difficult starting points than where we are at present, but there's no substitute for principled political unity in achieving mass working class consciousness. That's it. Okay, comrades. Uh, the uh, prompt asks us for discussing the organisational histories of our organisations and how it relates to the, quote, neo-social democracy question. I should say at the outset, in relation to San Sankara, Chiba, etc., I agree with Matthew's characterisation of, uh, it seems to me these guys have taken Kautsky's name 
uh, with all Kautsky's weaknesses which and errors and betrayals which are bloody important, uh, the line which they're defending in the name of Kautskyism is actually the line of uh, H.G. Wells and George Bernard Shaw in the Fabian Society, uh, and a line way, way to the right of Eduard Bernstein. Um, I've written about this in a series in the Weekly Work and Newspaper in uh, August, September 2019 uh, about the debate. The CPGP uh, Provisional Central Committee uh, is in its origin a splinter off the old official Communist Party. Uh, it was in origin an illegal faction of the old official Communist Party around a magazine called The Leninist, started up in the early 1980s, um, which was uh, derived from a group uh, in substance influenced by the ideas of the TKP, Turkish Communist Party, uh, led by Yuri Koglu. Um, the uh, uh, comrades... Uh, uh, when the Euro Communists uh, liquidated the old party in uh, 1991, uh, the uh, comrades, in spite of being an extraordinarily small group, uh, seized the name in order to deny the Euro Communists the political right uh, to liquidate the name of the Communist Party of Great Britain. But our politics is not, we don't claim that we are the party. We claim that it's necessary to reforge a communist party, uh, to create a party which can have as much leverage as uh, the old party had uh, in its best periods, uh, among other things, in the 1920s. Okay, it was a small party in the 1920s, the Unified Communist Party. We're talking about a party at that time about the size of the present Socialist Workers' Party in the range, uh, the British Socialist Workers' Party, which is in the range, it has paper membership of uh, 4,500, but a paying membership of something between 1,200 and 2,000. Um, uh, the difference, however, is that the uh, old CP of the 1920s, created by a fusion and uh, having real roots in the uh, uh, British workers' movement uh, through both the former Social Democratic Federation in London and Manchester, South Wales, uh, uh, socialist societies in the uh, mines in, the, in South Wales and the um, former Delayanists, the, the pro-unity wing of the Delayanists in Scotland. Uh, the uh, CP had more presence in the workers' movement uh, than any of the uh, 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 Trotskyist organisations have. Uh, why look at the past history? I start with a very simple point. Uh, it, it, refusing to look at history is like volunteering for Alzheimer's. Yeah. Quite literally, if you don't know, uh, and in a sense this is what, what do you think the dialectic is, my understanding of the dialectic is that the present is a category which refers to an expectation that the immediate future will be similar to the immediate past. But there is no such entity as, quote, the present, other than that expectation about the immediate future derived from the immediate past. But then... Uh, there is an in the past is the not future, and the future is the not past, and there is an interpenetration of these uh, negation. These, 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 the future and the past is an interpenetrated negation in time, not an interpenetrated negation of subject and object, but an interpenetrated negation in time. Okay, this is going into very abstract theory. Um, but then the consequence of this is that it's impossible to have any understanding of where the future is going without thinking about uh, the dynamics of the past. Where CPGP PCC at the moment is, uh, is a weak position. I'd say this honestly. We are a micro-organisation which by some sort of miracle manages to put out a weekly newspaper. We think it's fundamental to put out a weekly newspaper, a regular 
I might be a, a monthly, might be a regular useful, but it's fundamental to put out a regular newspaper because regular publication is capable of being agenda setting. Whether we succeed in agenda setting is another question, but regular publication is capable of being agenda setting, which all uh, blogs and um, mere websites and so on and so forth are not capable of being agenda setting in the same sense. We are uh, the um, Cassandra of the British far left. We uh, have a long history of predicting that various initiatives of one sort and another will fail, being denounced for predicting that they will fail and not giving, make, doing our best to make them work, but they nonetheless fail. Um, uh, so uh, Cassandra is a nice thing. We think that uh, there is no way of the construction of a mass of a serious communist party except way through the existing left. And the reason for that is because the workers' vanguard is not a political phenomenon and defining it in terms of the more advanced section of the working class is profoundly mistaken. It is the activist layer that the working class throws up among its, out of its own ranks, and which is amalgamated with the element of the intelligentsia which comes over to the side of the working class. Yeah. And that is a social layer which is produced by a sociological phenomenon, which is the guerrilla struggle of the working class over wages and conditions, over housing and tenants associations, through cooperatives, but also through collectivist, political party collectivism, uh, even where the political party collectivism is of an extraordinarily politically weak and problematic form. This is a guerrilla struggle which runs between the capitalist class and the working class in capitalist society and throws up this broad vanguard layer, the consequence of which is that every left organization which attempts to go directly to the masses will find itself in competition with other left organizations saying very similar things. And what is presented to the masses is the image of the uh, Judean People's Front and the People's Front of Judea from Monty Python's uh, 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 Life of Brian, or alternatively, 57 varieties. I can't remember who it was who coined the idea that there are 57 varieties of Trotskyist, I think it was, uh, in the 1970s, 1980s. Um, so that it's through the, the existing workers' vanguard is both the social layer out of which there can be a workers' party, a communist party, a Marxist party, and also the most profound obstacle. Because, of course, the reality is that this, op this vanguard is consumed with the idea uh, that we need to go to the masses and that in order to need to go to the masses, we need to shut up about political differences and we need to adapt our political ideas to those which are, in cons are consistent with the immediate and elementary ideas of the masses uh, and that in consequence, hence, we get this thing of all these different groups with tactical differences among themselves which reproduce themselves. Um, so going back to this, where, where are we getting these ideas from? Uh, CPGB, the core comrades, the comrades who are the core of CPGB, got these ideas about the nature of the party essentially from reading V.I. Lenin's collected works. It was the difference between reading V.I. Lenin's collected works from beginning to end on the one hand, and on the other hand reading a selected works which is selected for the purposes of the Stalinist bureaucracy or for any this particular Trotskyist group or that particular Trotskyist group. Um, and uh, we, uh, I, I'm not going to repeat, Matthew referred to the uh, snowball effect which happened after the Gotha unification 
uh, in uh, Germany and which was then repeated by, in fact, most of the parties of the Second International were created by such unification arrangements in which small groups unified and that creates a snowball effect. What I am going to say is that snow unifications on an unprincipled basis have had very similar snowball effect uh, in the past. And we can see that uh, with uh, the um, Brazilian Workers' Party, which was originally a unification of uh, uh, some Catholic trade unionists with uh, a number of different Trotskyist and leftist groups, um, grew very rapidly into a mass, well not very rapidly, it grew slowly but then kicked off into a mass form. Um, Refondazione Comunista was a, the, the, the la, a large minority out of the Italian CP after the liquidation of that party into the Democratic Party, which opened up its ranks to the larger Trotskyist and far leftist organizations outside, and again rapid development to 100,000 prox members and uh, profound political influence, which they then squandered by joining uh, the Prodi government and uh, uh, wrecked the, par the, the party that they'd achieved. Um, the Scottish Socialist Party, again, much smaller scale, uh, considerably more opportunist, but nonetheless, Scottish militant labor coming out of the Trotskyist tradition, opened up to the other Trotskyist groups uh, through its electoral campaigning around the against the poll tax, um, and created the Scottish Socialist Party, which uh, it, it's uh, an organisation of a few thousand. But then Scotland is a country of no more than five million, so that uh, this is a somewhat different uh, ball game. I have personal background in the sense that I was uh, activist in Oxford in the 1970s, which was a town of 100,000 in which we had over 100 Trotskyists. And having over 100 th Trotskyists in a town of 100,000, we uh, and the one of the Trotskyist groups had the leadership of the trade union at the uh, car plant, uh, which was the principal employer in the uh, in the town. It creates a very different set of political dynamics than the political dynamics of small Trotskyist groups uh, 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 trying competing with each other, you know, because we were concerned about uh, really serious, real politics about uh, the strike, strike struggle and about um, choices uh, FX uh, to, we, okay, we did the orthodox thing of opposing membership of the European Union in 1975, but we did it in a very different way uh, in alliance between the Trotskyists and the, quote, tankies, unquote, in the old Communist Party uh, on the basis of oppose the EU in favour of a uh, globalist, uh, a world perspective rather than a British nationalist perspective and refusing. We were both the tankies in were denounced by CP headquarters for not allowing Enoch Powell, the right winger, onto the platforms in Oxford. And we were denounced by the Trotskyist headquarters for not allowing Enoch Powell onto the platform in Oxford. Different world. Um, now, the corollary principled unification, uh, it, I don't think that unification that, that, that principled uh, unification on the basis of uh, 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 open the possibility of open discussion guarantees you against splits. Yeah. Um, we have recently had splits among our micro group. Uh, we've had a split with uh, a comrade who wanted to engage in uh, broad front initiative with uh, Labour leftists within the. Uh, Corbyn movement. We've just had a split last week of a comrade who's walked out over free speech and the trans issue. Um, uh, so it doesn't immunise you completely from splits, but if you don't have open discussion, if you don't have open factionalism, in the first place, if you don't have open factionalism, you haven't banned factions altogether. You've banned all factions except cliques in the apparatus. Mm -hmm. uh, the clique in the... This is Trotsky 
Trotsky in Third International after Lenin, but it's reconfirmed over and over and over again in Trotskyist and Maoist organisations. If you ban factionalism, what you're banning is all the factions except the, the full-time apparatus. Mm. Equally, if you don't have, if you have internal discussions, no public discussions, uh, it's impossible for anybody other than your own members to learn from your discussions. Mm. And in reality, actually, uh, again, my experiences in the uh, Mandalite Unified Secretariat of the Fourth International is that the educational part of that experience, the, the experience from which people learned, was the, 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 the conflict of opposing opinions forced people to think about what the theoretical foundations of the arguments were, what the evidence of one side and another of the, in the arguments were. So that uh, the open discussion, yes, it creates the, possi it creates the possibility of uh, principled unity, but uh, it doesn't guarantee you that you doesn't guarantee you from splits, but it's more fundamental that in order to have an education, a party which educates and organises, uh, you have to um, have uh, that sort of open discussion. I said, yeah, I said at the outset uh, that uh, uh, the CPGB leadership comrades came to this through reading Lenin's collected works. And it's easy to tag this as being, we've said uh, that the Bolshevik party was part of the center tendency in the Second International. That is to say the Bolshevik party was not a part of the uh, semi-syndicalist left in the Second International uh, reflected in Luxembourg and Co's SDKPIL or in the Delayanists or for that matter, the impossibilists of the um, uh, British uh, uh, Socialist Party of Great Britain. Mm -hmm. um, but actually what we're looking for, the point, the fundamental point is actually what we're looking for is the retrieval of, the, of Bolshevism, mm -hmm. uh, not uh, a, a delusion of reconstructing, imagining of reconstructing the uh, Second International as it was before the catastrophe of 1914, uh, when I have to say that a significant part of the mass actionist left, uh, led by Parvus and others, went over to German chauvinism in August 1914. So it's not only the Kautskyites who went over to German chauvinism in 1914. Um, and uh, that, so what we're looking for is not just reconstruct the Second International, but it's reconstruct the element of the Second International, uh, which can be shown through Bolshevism to have been uh, uh, a way in which the working class can get close to power even if it doesn't, at the end of the day, succeed in holding power. That's it. Thanks very much, Matthew. Thanks, Mike, for your initial remarks. Um, before opening up to questions, I think just a little bit more dialogue between the two speakers would be um, an excellent way to kind of continue this conversation. Um, so as well as maybe um, you've kind of got responses to each other's um, talks that you've given, I've also just written down a couple of questions which maybe you want to respond to, but um, just for you to consider. One of those is taken from a, a comment in the live stream chat, and it's to, to Matthew. What, what drew you, well, it, this is my version of the comment, but what drew you, Matthew, to the CPGB, and what drew Cosman to the CPGB's ideas and thought? Um, and, and, and strategy, and, but also more importantly, maybe what differences do you have in Cosmonaut and in the Marxist Unity Group to the CPGB? What makes you a separate organization? Um, to Mike, what's your prognosis for the Marxist Unity Group and its assessment of the DSA? Um, and I'd also just be interested to hear both, from both of you a little bit more about your kind of critiques of Trotskyism and Trotskyist groups today. So those are just kind of potential options, but most of all, if you could kind of respond to each other, that would be great. Um, maybe you've got like three, three, four minutes. 
Yeah. Um, so I guess what drew the sort of, I can't speak for the people who actually founded Cosmonaut because I came from attraction to Cosmonaut into the um, project, but I think what, what they initially found attractive about um, the CPGB was experience on the far left. Um, I think that uh, Mike's book, Revolutionary Strategy, and um, a lot of the output of the CPGB very like astutely um, addresses the problem of the bureaucratic confessional sect and the reasons for the division of the left into um, so many competing Grouplets all trying to do the same, like they all want to monopolize the same activity that objectively exists in the world um, for their own, uh, to, to build up their own sect um, because they each want to become the, the mass vanguard party by, by directly connecting to the masses um, rather than engaging with each other's ideas and, um, and developing a correct uh, political program that they can uh, unite around. Um, criticisms of the CPGP. Um, I don't know, uh, you know what, I mean, practically what could have been done with the Corbin moment. I know that they engaged with it. I uh, agree with their political orientation, but in terms of like practice, obviously they didn't come out of it much larger than they went into it. Not that building the sect is the point though, um, but they didn't produce a political effect of uh, uniting people in that moment, but also that has to do with what other organizations on the far left were doing. Um, I'd also say, you know, uh, Mike referenced uh, a, a member of the CPGB leaving this week over uh, the trans rights issue. Um, you know, this, the CPGB program denounces transphobia, but it's it's a little bit underdeveloped on the issue. And the Weekly Worker has published. Um, you know, writers who have, I would say, transphobic uh, opinions on that uh, on that question, and there hasn't been, um, you know, much besides uh, Mike's recent sort of five article series. There hasn't been much sort of combating of uh, reactionary tendencies in w within the workers' movement um, against uh, you know the rights of trans people. Um, so I guess I, I think more theoretical development and taking an emancipatory position on that question, regardless of the free speech issue, which, you know, I, I think that free speech is important, but, you know, in the in the speech, in the debate, I would definitely be on the side of um, trans, uh, trans rights in, in British society where they're under attack. Um, and then, okay, I'm forgetting the, the final question, but, um, oh, oh So I, I did ask you why not become a faction of the CPGB. That, that was maybe. Well, we're in America and they're in Britain. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, I, I think that there's an admirable policy of, of the CPGB, um, which is that they don't want to form an oil slick international of like, you know, we have this orga this international organization that then seeds itself into a bunch of countries, and then we set up like a fake international body that's act that's an international, but it's really the CPGB plus it's like sympathizers in a couple other countries. A lot of British Trotskyist groups have done that, and it makes them seem more important than they actually are. I'd rather be influenced by their ideas and, and fight, for, fight for correct politics than be in sort of like a fake political unity with them by being in a, the same international organization. Um, critiques of Trotskyism, you know, I think that the transitional program uh, that many Trotskyists adhere to sort of erases the importance of the minimum program as a basic uh, conditions for the working class to take power. Either it's ultra leftist because it says it's between the dictatorship of the proletariat and socialism, so it's trying to bring out the transition to socialism before the working class has taken power, or it's reformist because it's not posing the question of the working class taking power. It's trying to push um, the existing reform struggle towards socialism without talking about um, you know working class rule. Um, so that's. That's that uh, criticism. Um, I think I'll just stick with answering the questions um, rather than talk about too much else. OK. Um, uh, Matthew has referred to the fact we, we adopted as a policy in CPGB, uh, we're not in favor of uh, uh, building uh, oil slick internationals. There's, if anything, the problem in the world, we, the working class needs an international but the problem is there's too many bleeding internationals. Uh, 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 there's the international of the official communist parties. There's the international of the um, 
uh, well, the uh, I, international socialist tendency led by the Socialist Workers Party. There's the Taffite International, which they smashed up. There's the et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We don't think that's productive. Uh, it's a more appropriate uh, uh, approach is to uh, uh, discuss and to have, have agreement where we have agreement and not also, the other feature of the Auslick internationals is, characteristically, you impose the same tactic on everybody. Yeah. So way back when, uh, in 79, uh, the uh, 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 Bureau of the Fourth International instructed the Lebanese section uh, to disband their armed organization and go into factories which given that Lebanon was at the time convulsed with civil war, uh, the proposal was damn stupid uh, 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 and just had no practical purchase, uh, uh, whatever. Um, the uh, uh, Tafite, well, the, the Grantite International had an, a policy of entry in social democratic parties wherever, which meant in whatever party was the party of the second in, of the socialist international. So the, they entered the uh, People's Party of Pakistan, which is just a bourgeois party which happened to be affiliated to the sec socialist international. Uh, this, why? Because the tactic in Britain, etc. So we want to be really cautious about uh, tactical judgments. And for that reason, I'm actually not going to, you know, I, 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 I'm not going to form a judgment about uh, the appropriateness of the comrades' uh, tactic in relation to uh, DSA, because at the end of the day, in order to actually uh, form more than a judgment of the general principles which one has to adopt, uh, what the right tactic is, is a, t is a question absolutely necessary for the comrades on the ground. Um, on uh, Trotskyism, uh, I've written about this at considerable length, partly in the uh, Revolutionary Strategy book. I come from Trotskyism. I spent uh, years 1974 to 1993 as a Trotskyist. Um, I was out of politics. I. Norman Finkelstein talked about uh, Finkelstein talked about uh, uh, the demoralisation caused by uh, the uh, collapse of the Maoist regime. Uh, for me, the uh, collapse of the USSR it wasn't the collapse of the USSR and the Eastern Bloc states, but the fact that the USSR collapsed and the Eastern Bloc states without there being any what the slightest indication of political revolution or any attempt by any section of the working class or indeed any section of the bureaucracy to represent the faction of rice, as Trotsky referred to it, the anti-restorationist side, that meant that there was a really fundamental need for rethinking. Yeah. And I conclude from that that my, this is just me, not uh, CPGB because we have, a different, we have different theoretical takes on particularly this question, the Soviet question. Yeah. I conclude that because the bureaucracy was a labor bureaucracy, the Soviet bureaucracy was a labor bureaucracy, and one of the things which the Chinese regime is is a labor bureaucracy sitting alongside being a capitalist exploiting group. Yeah. Because it was a labor bureaucracy, it prevented the low-level guerrilla struggle because anybody who popped their head up as an activist was either going to be incorporated in the bureaucracy or sent to the gulag or to a psychiatric institution. Mm -hmm. And because of that, the working class could not have a vanguard. And because of that, the working class had no chance of having a party within the Soviet and similar bureaucratic regimes, and therefore there could be no resistance. Yeah. So my judgment then is that the bureaucracy politically expropriated the working class by the ban on factions in 1921, and uh, it wasn't carried into full effect until the late 1920s, but the constitutional transition is 1921. Yeah. And, but having not but, but re remained socially dependent on the working class with the result that there was no way that there could be political revolution. But then if there was no way that this is, was one of the central elements of Trotskyism, 
political revolution. If there was no way there could be political revolution, then the 1930 version of permanent revolution is false. Because all you do with the 1930 version is you create a repetition of the Soviet experience and it's bound to end in the same way. Um, the 1907 version of permanent revolution, that is that the working class could not hold power for more than a few months without the victory of, in the West, uh, that would be, in my opinion, I still think that's correct. So I'm, I'm, I'm not a Trotskyist on uh, the, uh, I think the transitional program is, uh, was just a fudge to get round the conflict between uh, Bukharin and his supporters who wanted to abolish the minimum program and Lenin and his supporters who wanted to maintain the minimum program um, uh, in the uh, Fourth Congress of Comintern. Um, so I don't think the transitional program, I don't think the permanent revolution. On the other hand, I'm still a Trotskyist in respect of uh, I don't agree with the bureaucratic centralism. I don't agree with the People's Front. I don't agree with socialism in one country, national roads to socialism, that stuff. Uh, on that, I'm an unrepentant Trotskyist. That's it. Thanks. Okay. So we're going to open up to questions. I can already see three hands. Okay, hang on. Um, the first hand I think I saw was right at the back. Uh, and also then Rebe there's Re so Rebecca and then right at the back. Sorry, who's first? I didn't know. Rebecca. Rebecca. Um, hi, hi, everyone. Um, thank you very much for those remarks. They're uh, fascinating. I can't wait to... Uh, reflect on them for the next couple months. I mean, until the next convention, you know, we'll, we'll, it kind of recreates itself in time. Um, so this is a question specifically for Mike, but it, it doesn't it implicate, um, you know, questions kind of about uh, how how your work was received um, in the U.S. So um, in the 2020 Winter Communist University, um, London Platypus member Rory um, asked Jack Conrad, who is another kind of um, um, you know, key key figure in the CPGB. Why the CPGB had failed to recruit new and or younger members during the Corbyn years, right? So when the CPGB had um, tried to develop a strategy to work and recruit in the Labour Party, and please feel free to correct me if I have any of these things wrong. Now with a bit more distance from the 2019 election where Jeremy Corbyn lost, um, you know, or the Labour Party lost and Jeremy Corbyn's um, kind of leadership came into crisis, and actually the entire labor left came into crisis and is continuing to do so. Can you speak to why, can you, or can you try to speak to why the Corbyn years were not fruitful for the growth of the CBGB, and why, you think, and why do you think your work was instead taken up by the young political milieu um, around the left of the Democratic Party in the United States? Okay, well, not just around guys in the left of the, uh, of the United States, but also by guys in the Netherlands um, and to some extent uh, uh, elsewhere in Europe, uh, there's some uh, influence. Um, in relation to the Corbyn stuff, uh, my understanding, this is just me, yeah. Um, my understanding is that it was right to go in with the Corbyn movement and uh, that the uh, bit of, bits of the left which chose not to go in with the Corbyn movement either did so, as was the case with the Morning Star, because they wanted to support the Labour bureaucracy. They wanted friendly relations with the, with the, the trade union bureaucracy and therefore they didn't want to upset the Labour bureaucracy by communists going into the Labour Party. They were explicit about that. Or alternatively, as far as the Socialist Workers' Party and the Socialist Party were concerned, the Socialist Party was of the view that the Labour Party is a purely bourgeois party. When the, the, for, for, the, for that then, the Corbyn movement looked like, excuse me? Yeah. Uh, and the uh, Socialist Workers' Party have made it a point of principle ever since they left the Labour Party in 1968 that you have to be organisationally separate. Mm. Uh, my understanding is that the politics of the Socialist Workers' Party consists of uh, programmatic flexibility for tactical intransigence and programmatic flexibility. This is the British Socialist Workers' Party, not the American Socialist Workers' Party. Uh, I.e. that they'll change their political line 
uh, with extraordinary uh, instability and rapidity, but they cling to certain tactical nostrums of which uh, street action strikes and um, not going into entry in social democracy is consistent. Okay, so we went into the uh, Labour Party uh, with uh, our microscopic small forces and our weekly newspaper. We created a, um, a front uh, Labour Party Marxists and a, a front newspaper Labour Party Marxist um, and we did uh, as far as possible agitational work in the we tried to do agitational work directed to the 200, 300, 400,000 people who went into the Labour Party uh, directed to Labour Party conference and so on and so forth but uh, we were always much much smaller forces uh, the Corbyn leadership was run by another faction coming out of what was called straight left. Um, the straight, uh, Seamus Milne, uh, Andrew Murray, they come out of the straight left faction of the old Communist Party. Yeah. And they were committed to uh, a unity of the left of the Labour Party with the, what they saw as the winnable centre of the Labour Party. That was their strategic orientation. V the Czech, Vladimir Dera had come up with this idea in Campaign for Labour Party Democracy. That was the trend which was in control. And they had control through momentum, uh, through uh, the, the uh, um, uh, trying to remember the guy's name, owned the, re the mailing list outright. And mo hmm? King John Landsman. Landsman, yeah, Landsman owned the, the reading list outright, and he owned the Momentum brand name, and he set lawyers on uh, to uh, local groups which tried to s set up Momentum local groups which didn't agree with him. So the, all, in spite of this mass movement into the Labour Party, the existing vanguard, that is to say in this case, the existing left social democratic activist layer controlled it. Yeah. And um, yes, we didn't win significant we won we, we we recruited we had recruited a very few people in this period we had people drop out of activity in this period though this is largely because they were i think uh, the comrade from uh, sweden referred to this as a problem that you recruit people who are in their late teens and uh, then they, they get into their 20s and they get jobs and kids and stuff like that and they're not going to do the same amount of activity um uh, so we, we we had people uh, uh, going in for reduced activity. We did actually lose somebody who went to the broad frontist Vladimir Dera, mo not actually to momentum, but to a triangulation between us and momentum, which was a waste of space. Um, okay, tactically, I still I still think it was. It, it, it was a mass movement. It was like it would be like you a strike happens, which you think is almost certain to lose, but you go in and you do strike support work. Yeah. This was a class struggle. The Corbyn movement. It was a class struggle over the Labour Party. And we intervened in that mass class struggle. We didn't win. We lost. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, he, 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 that's that's where we are, as it were. Yeah, well, I think picked up outside of the UK simply, it's, hey, uh, we, CPGP, we insist on publicity of debates. Yeah. So we publish our own internal debates, but we also publish the internal debates of the Socialist Workers' Party, the Socialist Party, etc. If insofar as people, we can get information about them. Because we think that the movement as a whole needs to know about the political debates which are going on. Yeah. And on that basis, the uh, leaderships of the existing far left groups hate us. Um, okay, we, we 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 would like it if they were willing to listen, but at the moment they aren't, and that's the state of play. Um, we have, it, I, and I guess that it's that that that's where it is. That's it's. Uh, 
that that's why our ideas have been picked up more widely outside the UK than inside the UK. Uh, thanks for your uh, comments. Is this good? The mic? Okay. Um, so how are the reformists of today different from the reformists of the Second International? And what does that difference mean for the socialist left today or the people who want to see a socialist left reconstituted? I think a big difference is that the reformists in the Second International were trying to reform capitalism into socialism. The reformists of today generally just want some reforms on capitalism. They're below reformism. I think the Jacobin milieu are, on, are actual reformists. Um, in, in like Baskar Sankara is not everyone who writes for Jacobin. I think he actually think or you know actually would pursue um, reforming capitalism into socialism. Um, you know, and Allende was a, a real reformist, uh, tried to reform capitalism into socialism. But a lot of reformism today, most reformist parties have reform programs that um, are not about uh, actually reforming um, capitalism into socialism. How that, you know, how you relate to it as different, um, you know, I think it becomes something that's less coming out of Marxism, uh, you know, Bernstein, you know, the, the reformists of today are, you know, they may reference Marxism, but, but they'll distance themselves from, um, from its uh, political history more if, if they're not talking about the final goal of socialism so much, um, or at least in a recognizable form. Um, but, but ultimately, I mean, reformism was a minority trend in the Second International up to 1914, whereas it's a, a, a vast majority trend within the socialist movement today. So that's that's a really <laughs> big difference, um, that that uh, the Second International was a movement of millions um, where the majority trend was revolutionary Marxism. Um, and right now we have a left that's much smaller and has much worse ideas. Yeah, I'll just add to that. Uh, in the aftermath of 1945, British and US intelligence put a lot of resource uh, into uh, two things, one of which was the reconstruction of the German SPD and other continental socialist parties on the model of the British Labour Party. And the other was interventions in the academy, which are reflected in the published work of ex-intelligence officials, Peter Nettle, uh, Shorska, uh, uh, Leo Valiani, uh, around the idea that there were only two viable alternatives available uh, to uh, the socialist movement, one of which was the line of uh, uh, Bernstein, which was right but repulsive because it was committing to uh, entering into coalition government with the uh, capitalists, and the other which was wrong but romantic was the line of Rosa Luxemburg, um, sorry, right but repulsive and wrong but romantic comes from uh, uh, 1066 and all that, characterizing the roundheads as right but repulsive and the cavaliers as wrong but romantic. Um, and uh, the post, uh, the, the, the modern post Bad Godesburg uh, quote reformism, post. Uh, uh, Wilson reformism uh, in the social, in the things parties which call themselves social democracy is on lines laid down by British and American intelligence in 1945-47 uh, and persistently produced by ex-intelligence officials as ideology since, so that it's uh, much more state controlled and much more state dependent than even the pre-war, pre-1940 Labour Party. Okay, um, I think on the stack is Ephraim and at the very front here, I also see Spencer and uh, three people at the back. It's a little bit hard to see, so uh, I can, okay. so. Could you go to Ephraim? Yeah, I've got the mic. Um, thank you both very much, um, Ephraim from Platypus in the UK. Um, I'd like to ask about the 
way in which this revolutionary strategy in these two groups has an object of critique and how that forms their position. I think it's clear from everything Mike has said, the high degree of importance of the British Socialist Workers' Party for the CPGB. And you know, I learned a lot reading the uh, takedown, let's say, in the Weekly Worker of the pre-convention documents of the Socialist Workers' Party's uh, annual affair. And you know, one of the major events that has intervened between the publication of Mike's book in 2008 and the present is the collapse or the crisis or the whatever you want to call it of the Socialist Workers' Party. And I would suggest humbly that part of the issues that the CPGB wrestles with is the disappearance of its object of critique, of cliffism in a specific way and that that raises a question of how you continue with this strategy absent your object of critique. And so the question, you know, so I would put that to Mike for a response, and then the question to Matthew would be, what exists on the American left that can um, act for you as the object of critique that is in any way equivalent to what the British SWP was f through the from 77 uh, through to 2013, let's say. Um, and how do you understand, you know, the the map of the American left, which you are seeking to uh, argue for revolutionary uh, Marxist unity in, when it has, you know, the ISO has disappeared and the factions in the DSA do not seem to constitute objects um, against which particular political points such as the CPG be made against the SWP can be made in the same way. Uh, just as a rider to that, to what extent for your two groups does capitalist politics form a kind of object of critique? And how do you think about the way in which you orient to changes and crises uh, in capitalist politics for the way in which you seek to uh, effectuate your strategy of, of Marxist unity on the far left? Sure. Um, so I guess, yeah, in terms of um, an object of critique, uh, equivalent to the Socialist Workers' Party. I guess, you know, I would disagree that that, that is so foundational to the politics of the CPGB. Um, you know, the Leninist faction started in the Communist Party of Great Britain, the original, which was a much more significant organization in uh, the British workers' movement than the Socialist Workers' Party was. And from what I understand, the Socialist Workers' Party, until the CPGB disappeared, was always failing to be um, as deeply rooted in the working class movement um, as the CPGB. Um, what the Leninist objects of critique were, were the factions within the CPGB, the straight leftists, um, the Morning Star, the Euro Communists, um, and these were these were trends within uh, a mass class organization. Um, so, you know, DSA's faction. I mean, the DSA is less rooted in the working class um, in the United States than the CPGB was. But I guess I would disagree that that um, you need a largish sect that that's the main object that you're criticizing to have a political purpose. The ISO disappeared, um, but cliffism in the United States um, partly lives on. Uh, there's an organization called Tempest, uh, publishes a magazine and has a faction in DSA, although they're sort of agnostic on engaging with DSA now. Um, and they have uh, sort of spontaneous uh, Cliffite politics, but they've gone full in for, for social imperialism around the war in Ukraine as well um, for another sort of dose of, of bad politics. Um, so, you know, I would say that, that there are plenty of objects of critique on the U.S. left, um, but there is a, an existing U.S. left, and there are, are 
you know, if you go to protests in any American city, um, you go to five of them in a year, it'll be a lot of the same layer of activists. And I think a lot of people on the left who are a little bit more disillusioned, aren't, haven't just joined a sect, will um, be very critical of the activists. So they're the meaningless people who show up to everything. But also, as Mike was saying, the activists are both the problem in their current state and part of the solution because they are um, the fighters that uh, the class struggle th shows up. Um, same goes with like uh, trade union militants. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, I, I would reject some of the premises that there needs to be a single object of critique. But, but in terms of capitalist politics, you know, I'd say that that's a significant object of critique in terms of our revolutionary democratic orientation, seeing how what's called democracy um, has frustrated, uh, you know, working class um, self emancipation, um, and you know, rediscovering the Marxist critique of um, of liberal constitutional regimes which existed in the Second International, um, which wasn't just counterposing them to Soviets, which is what a lot of Trotskyist organizations do. There was a radical democratic critique of the French Third Republic, of uh, the American Republic, um, that was sort of uh, based around the Paris Commune and the Jacobin Constitution of 1793. Um, and it wasn't just saying, you know, the working class will rule through a Soviet Republic. Um, it was posing radical uh, democracy as the form of rule of the working class. Uh, Ephraim, I don't think the SWP is anything like dead. Um, but leave aside that, it's certainly not the case that it's our sole object of critique. Uh, uh, we haven't got much. We haven't got so much on uh, what's going on with the internal machinations of the uh, uh, Communist Party of Britain, uh, though. Um, uh, we would if we could. Uh, it's a question that we've been less able to get informants uh, <laughs> uh, coming out of that uh, tradition, who ha coming out of that uh, organisation, who have uh, clear political ideas. In fact, that's also true of the SWP. That uh, the SWP has become an organisation which recruits uh, freshers at uh, freshers fairs and dumps them down. Um, uh, we also do quite a lot of effort on critiquing the uh, Socialist Party of England and Wales. Uh, um, and we spend a fair amount of time. Uh, the, the, the Alliance for Workers' Liberty has been uh, social imperialist since the early 1980s. Um, this is the Matt Gamner organisation. used to be called, once upon a time it was called... Um, Dear me, uh, socialist organizer, and then it became uh, that. But it's been a social imperialist organization since the 1980s. Uh, the uh, Mandelites have rather surprisingly gone over to social imperialism, uh, to, some, to me a little bit surprisingly, I suppose because I'm an ex member. It's to me surprising that they should go over to social imperialism around Ukraine, though in reality also around Libya before. And uh, uh, the demand for the uh, uh, Gilbert Ash car racing, the demand for uh, American planes to uh, intervene in support of the Kurds in Syria was sort of pretty much close to social imperialism. Um, nonetheless, uh, we are engaged, we try to engage with the far left. Um, We also try to engage with uh, high constitutional politics as an object of uh, an object of critique, and that I think is as important uh, because what we're trying to do is to get the rest of the left to take constitutional political issues seriously, which at the moment they don't. That's it. Uh, normally I would have written this down, but my hands were full. But I've been wanting to ask this for like months because I had an argument with my friend Ben, who's somewhere in here about this. Um, so, Mike, you said that you think that your thought, the CPGB has gained like popularity in the United States among groups like the DSA and now MUG, 
because you guys were successful in like transmitting your ideas and recording like all of your internal meetings, like et cetera, et cetera. And I won't undermine that that definitely had something to do with it. However, there is something to be said that Bhaskar Sankara was inspired specifically by your book. Um, and there seemed to be some like weight to, although you now reject, you say you now like reject the neo Kautskyanism. Uh, however, you would like to characterize your thought that seems to have some uh, recurring importance in the United States. Um, I would like to ask, why is it now that Bhaskar's like kind of entryism with Jacobin into the DSA was greatly inspired by this new wave of neo-Kautskyanism, neo there now seems to be this recurrence with Mug that also has to do with this entryism into the DSA regarding making it into a kind of mass party. Um, I would, specifically, I want to know why is this historically recurring and why is it different this time? Um, because although you may characterize Bhaskar as like an authentic reformist, there is the other thing of like, Bhaskar is not like a stupid guy. He's like well read and, and he understood what he was doing when he considered himself like in 2010 a neo Kautskyist. Um, why is it different this time? Now it's on this like second wave. Why is the, to quote Nietzsche, the second, uh, the second nature not weaker than the first here? That's all. Okay, that, that, that is addressed to me. I, I cannot, I certainly, I, I said I don't take responsibility for the MUG guys because we're not engaged in building uh, oil slick internationals, but it's our fortiori. I r absolutely refuse to take any responsibility for Bhaskar Sankara or Viv Vivek Chibber. Yeah. Vivek Chibber in particular because I polemicised directly against the guy. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, I characterised him as Rip Van Winkle. Uh, fallen asleep uh, when the Euro communists were at their height and now revived their ideas and the name of the Second International. But it, the ideas are ideas of the Euro communists, nothing to do with the ideas of the Second International. Um, and um, I think that the, the, the underlying problem is that the, the issue about electoral politics. And the question is, what are we trying to do with electoral politics? It is useless uh, to try and do, to, it is useless to refuse electoral politics. This is, that's just uh, what uh, uh, Lenin called anti-parliamentary cretinism. Mm -hmm. And uh, if the reality is that the possibility of uh, working class intervention in electoral politics is one of the cracks like the partial legality of trade unions in the same way. Le trade unions are not completely legal, but they're slightly legal. And it's a crack through which the working class can act. In the same way, uh, the bourgeoisie has been unable to hold the line in favor of the property franchise uh, because they were unable to resist the temptation to shift the burden of taxation onto indirect taxes. And then it became impossible to l l keep, keep hold of the idea of the property franchise uh, or for that matter of, um, except in special cases. So the City of London government is a property franchise. Uh, the House of Lords in England is a, uh, a co-optative body like the Venetian Senate. Um, but. Uh, these things are cracks into which the working class can insert itself. But it's cracks into which the working class can insert itself on condition that it doesn't buy into the idea that you have to uh, form a government in order to pass legislation. And uh, you can fight from opposition for legislation. Imagine that you're a big organization. You can fight from opposition for legislation, but um, and you can win legislation from opposition. So the legalization of trade unions in Great Britain in the 19th century was won from opposition, not from government. Mm. Um, the... Uh, 
but the idea that you can have to be, form a government leads into we have to form a coalition which is big enough to win a parliamentary majority. Yeah. And that by winning a parliamentary majority, we can progress and we wind up with the opposite of anti-parliamentary cretinism, which is parliamentary cretinism, and which the Corbyn leadership displayed absolutely in full flood, that they hoped to get rid of the Tory government by uh, backing the manoeuvres of the Tory opponents of British exit from the European Union. The consequence of which is that they uh, played politically into the hands of the um, uh, Tory supporters of British exit from the European Union who appealed to working class voters who had voted for exit. Yeah. Um, that parliamentary cretinism that it's all about manoeuvres within the House of Commons and nothing out of doors and the same what... Uh, Matt's been talking about in relation to the squad, that you imagine that what you're doing, you get people in. The point of getting people in uh, is voice. The point of working class electoral activity is voice for the movement, not uh, the, the, the certainty of winning uh, legislation. Mm. And the problem then, however, is that the large majority of people who want to do electoral work, what they are pursuing is uh, a government. And they have a delusion which is given to them by the third and fourth congresses of the Comintern, that the workers' government slogan is the way to concretize the question of workers' power. So that even when people are, think of themselves as communists, they can fall into this governmental, governmental illness. Okay, so it's a practical, big, serious, practical problem, and I don't, I, I'm not saying that I, we've got the solution to it, but that we've got a, an approach to it which is capable of, is, has the possibility of uh, creating a broad uh, mass movement which can approach closer to power than uh, was achieved than can be achieved by the, either the coalitionist line or the general strikist line, but not um, uh, 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 not we've got the solution right to hand and it's straightforward. Yeah, and I mean I can respond about uh, about the Jacobin um, the Jacobin people. You know, I don't think that they were really committed to the, the strategy of opposition and anti-ministerialism. I mean, this is something that, you know, we've spoken to uh, in, in Cosmonaut and, and Marxist Unity Group, has spoken to people like Baskar, and he says, you know, um, I don't, you know, even less now, but but wasn't on board with the strategy of, of pure opposition, as he calls it, um, because they were, you know, they were nostalgic for uh, not... 19th and early 20th century social democracy, but mid-century social democracy. Um, and that was always a big part of the Jacobin project. Um, so it was not about revolutionary social, I mean, they were interested in the history of revolutionary social democracy because it's inspiring. Uh, even if you're a reformist, uh, it's inspiring to have millions of workers in these parties. Um, but in terms of the political strategy, I don't think they ever uh, you know, hitched their horses to that. Um, in terms of their activity in DSA, um, you know, from what I understand, their their entryism was before uh, 2017. They were sort of related to the left caucus that overthrew Harringtonism in 2017, um, but they haven't been very active in in struggles within the organization um, in 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 very recent years. Uh, you know, Eric Blanc. Um, in his new book on revolutionary social democracy, uh, he's inspired by the history. That's why he wrote a whole book on it. But I think he kind of changed his mind halfway through or, or from the beginning. And essentially, the book argues for Fabianism. Um, and it argues against the political strategy of, of the center tendency of revolutionary social democracy against anti-ministerialism. Uh, OK, so there's. There were three questions at the back. We've got Spencer first, and now there's two. Spencer an extra. Danny was next. Okay, great. Cool. <clears throat> yeah, um, I wanted to take up some of these thoughts about 
uh, historical process, um, not necessarily the the abstract um, characterization of the dialectic. I think we'll talk about that maybe tomorrow. Um, but it seems to me that you know we're talking you know in in you know, keeping it simple about long-term historical trajectories and sociological dynamics so that um you know for instance there were a lot of things that assumed a, a lot of things said that assumed a lot of things about the nature of society um such as regular publication is capable of being agenda setting and that that presupposes a whole lot about uh, the possibility of public reason and 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 how it's formed in society and uh, perhaps uh, the difference between that and, and public opinion, um, the you know, the, the significance of free discussion, not only for the people who are involved, but for uh, society at large. Um, but what I was, you know, perhaps most interested in is this question of, you know, there's really no way to get to a left except through the existing left. And there we had a, a sociological argument about how capitalism itself produces a left, uh, so that when you get to the masses, as it were, what you find is a, a pre-existing left, right? And I think you described that as part of the guerrilla struggle uh, between capital and labor. And it seems to me that if we think about that as sort of recreating um, the circumstance that we're trying to engage with as leftists, we're also confronted with the question of what sort of ideas, the kind of bad politics that was was raised. Uh, and and Mike, you are in the earlier panel, um, and to a degree here, we're talking about sort of 1921 to today, uh, from the Popular Front Against Fascism before World War II, v through uh, the International Popular Front during World War II, what kind of legacy that leaves us. And it seems to me that there's a question there of, you know, the qualitative degradation of both strategic ideas, you were talking there about, um, you know, Socialism in one country, national roads to socialism, the uh, party, you know, the party monolith, etc., that you were characterizing as the kind of uh, obstacles on the far left, and ministerialist social democracy on the other hand, as the legacies of the first, I mean, of the second and third internationals post World War One, respectively. And I guess what I'm interested in is the relationship between the kind of recurrence of cycles of capitalism and their uh, regeneration of this um, guerrilla struggle and, and the, the, the resistance against the de depredations of capital and the kind of ongoing degradation and disintegration of socialist ideology, which I it, you know, does that merely happen at the level of strategic ideas, or does it really happen also at the level of the conception of the prospects of the very goal of socialism? Um, that's a huge one. Yeah. Um, I think you're right that it happens, that the degradation happens at the level of the, 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 the the, 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 the prospect of the very goal of socialism and it's the paradox of this I said that the transitional program is merely a fudge in origin merely a fudge between um, the Leninists and the Bukharanists at the fourth congress of Comintern but the reality is that it massively degrades both that and the um, broad democratic front um, British road style advanced democracy stages before the question of socialism being posed, uh, the effect is the degradation and loss of the maximum program as well. Uh, so I've also written for the Weekly Worker on the question of 
why we need the minimum programme, but also on the question why we need the maximum programme and why we have to have more to say about the maximum programme um, in the wake of Stalinism uh, than the guys uh, it had to say, than Marx and Engels, who said, we don't have recipes for the cookshops of the future. But unfortunately, we've had a cookshop which served uh, uh, salmonella on the largest possible scale. Um, and so we do have to have things, something more to say about uh, recipes for the cookshops of the future. Um, so that the, the, in this sense, uh, it, yes, the end is degraded and not merely the strategy. And paradox is that the degrad in this case, the idea of the transitional program and the transitional method, that the, the method then degrades the end because it uh, uh, loses, we lose sight of the um, uh, ultimate emancipatory, of the eventual ultimate emancipatory project. Um, Regular publication capable of being agenda setting. It seems to me, I, uh, Norman Finkelstein's talk earlier is an illustration of the fact that uh, the bourgeois media, bourgeois press, precisely the press, by virtue of its character as regular publication, the New York Times can be agenda setting, the Murdoch press can be agenda setting, you know, um, and in fact, uh, the, uh, uh, the paradox, the Morning Star in Britain, which is the uh, daily, um, not quite, we, we always call it the Morning Star's Communist Party of Britain, because uh, these guys split from the old Communist Party before the Euro Communists liquidated it because they wanted to preserve the Morning Star. But the survival of the Morning Star is entirely dependent on financial subventions uh, from the major trade unions and from the People's Repub Democratic People's Republic of Korea and the People's Republic of China. Um, but the Morning Star uh, is agenda setting in favor of the broad front, the broad democratic front conception. Uh, in a way in which w the socialist worker, because it attempts to address the masses, is incapable, because it adapts itself to the present consciousness of the mass, is in incapable of being a gender setting. Yeah. Um, so I do think, I don't think that the uh, degradation of uh, public speech and so on and so forth means that there is an end to the uh, 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 regular pub press being capable of being a gender setting. Um, uh, the guerrilla struggle between capital and labor. Yeah, it's certainly the case that there can be, um, it is possible for the vanguard layer to be wiped out. Yeah. Uh, that's what happened in Indonesia. The Tokugawa regime actually succeeded in wiping out mass Christianity in Japan uh, in the early 1600s. So it's possible with sufficient repression uh, to wipe things out of that sort. But in relation to capital and labor, it seems to me that it is inevitable that there will be regeneration. Um, and we can see that regeneration of uh, taking place um, in the form of the uh, uh, very low level protest-based strike movement, but that is actually involving a uh, significant increase in uh, organized trade unionism, the recruitment of members to trade unions, the recruitment of activists to becoming trade union activists. So the lair reproduces itself. And I'm sorry to say, because it's sort of ambiguous, the, the leaven, year the leaven with which the bread is leavened, the leaven of the bad ideas of the existing left very, very small amount of uh, uh, official communism, standard Trotskyism, can spread extraordinarily broadly uh, through uh, 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 the left. So um, does that address you, your point? Thanks. I have a small addition to make on that on that question, which is, you know, when we talk about the weakness of the socialist movement of the left at the present or of its degeneration, um, you know, we are always referring to uh, a situation that is post the Second International. The the 
socialist movement is weak relative to 1890 to 1991 right now. Um, it's not, you know, the, the socialist movement, the workers' movement prior to uh, 1889, I think, uh, is the founding Congress of, of the Second International, is characterized by small feuding sects, by individual sort of dogmatic thought leaders who all have personal grievances against each other and, and uh, you know, call the, the cops of whichever country on each other. Uh, it looks a lot like today's left. Um, it was before that foundational act of unity in a uh, a political party that that's that's what the socialist movement looked like uh, in the 19th century. Um, in our in our current time, we have that effect of you know the the socialist movement that we had having been beat and we're back in that situation. Plus the ideological effect of the Soviet collapse. Um, there are you know powerful ideological arguments about human nature that get made. You know, to school children, uh, you know, uh, every day, and uh, in the media, that you know, this is what happens when you try to improve society too much. The French Revolution maybe was that uh, for the 19th century, although because France was so militarily powerful um, with Napoleon, you know, there was some credibility to, hey, this revolution really. Um, turbocharged French society, but I, I still think it, it played that role. Um, and then, you know, uh, Mike has used the example in, in articles in the Weekly Worker of sort of the example of the Italian merchant uh, city-state republics degenerating into one-man dictatorships and then that being used as an argument against republicanism hundreds of years later. Um, I think we are living in the ideological hangover of uh, Stalinism and the collapse of, of Stalinism um, as, a, as a powerful argument against socialism. Um, and so I think we can recover uh, the meaning of socialism by thinking and, and engaging in intellectual activity, in making political arguments, um, and, and in achieving that sort of fundamental act of unity in a political party that the Second International achieved and allowed it to um, sort of move like a, a, a locomotive um, forward and create the basis for the whole 20th century of wars and revolutions and um, and there being states that called themselves socialists, how, however uh, degenerated they may have been. Um, so, so that was a small addition to that point. Hmm. Yeah, thanks for that. I think that topic of democracy and republicanism could be interesting to carry on. But we've got time for a few more questions. We've got 10 minutes. So I, I think I maybe let's stack questions, so maybe two at a time. Okay, so I have a question actually for Matt, just off of what you were just talking about, about the kind of, um, I don't know, analogy or parallel of the kind of 1860s, 1870s feuding sex, and then kind of in the present, I guess that imagery kind of looks like that's happening in the DSA, with there's a lot of different factions, but there's also other things on the left as well. And I was thinking about when LaSalle founds that party, he's thinking about like Hungary and Germany in 1848, as he puts it in a letter to Marx that there was a republic, but nobody saw it. And so in a sense, you're founding a party to kind of prepare, to kind of prepare in terms of the memory of that revolution. And I think now the, the kind of strategy has seemed to be that the DSA somehow is representing that. And I know that, you know, a lot of how the DSA grew in the last, you know, decade, ha half decade was through Trump. There was the Trump bump. Yes, there was Bernie Sanders, but it seemed like a lot of the growth was out of a kind of despair in the face of Donald Trump. And we're also seeing it now in terms of, I guess, the prompt for tomorrow is late Bidenism. But, you know, Bidenism. You know, in other words, now that we have a Democrat in office, it seems to have kind of undercut the justification. And so then I'm wondering how, I know one of the strategies for MUG is to kind of uh, treat the DSA as a party or act like a party. I think that's the language from the statements of principle. And in that sense, how do you see the present as a kind of, you know, similar to the 1870s, have you said, but also how could it potentially be different? In other words, this I, I don't quite see the same kind of um, era. Hello. I actually think my question does tie into Danny's a little bit, but um, I guess just to start, I wanted to say I, I do appreciate the Weekly Worker and the CPGB a lot for what they do. I think there is a real thoroughness and encyclopedic level at which um, you guys approach the sort of questions of program or organization and also, you know, the 
history of the left, the history of the second international thinking about these problems. Um, and I guess what always, I don't know, what always makes me, what, there always feels like there's this disconnect because on the one hand, there's always this real sophistication in, for example, looking at the debates in the second international. But when it comes to contemporary politics or like contemporary action, it just becomes about the same thing that the rest of the left is involved in. So it becomes about, you know, BDS or it becomes about, you know, tenant unions or it becomes about, you know, transphobia. And so it's so sort of my question is, you know, why read the full collected works of V.I. Lenin if we're gonna do with it is, you know, like kick someone out for transphobia. Um, or like, why is, you know, like, how do these questions about like faction fighting, organization, these kinds of things, how are they relevant for this sort of situation? So sort of like Danny was saying, you know, like sure the Second International was this high point in the sort of development in this kind of history of socialism, but what is the relevance for that of that for today? And especially also in terms of like a politics that understands things in terms of like right lines or wrong lines where you know someone is reactionary or social imperialist and in that way you know they're wrong we can like reject them even at the same time that you're trying to reject a kind of like sectarianism um, and you want a foundational act of unity that can take you past sectarianism like was discussed before so that was kind of my question I can attempt to answer the, the first and second questions in part. Um, you know, in relation to the first question, I guess I was a little bit uh, confused as uh, to what was being referred to with DSA. Um, you know, yeah, DSA is incredibly weak uh, relative to the parties of the Second International. Um, the point I was previously making that was that we're in a situation uh, that's closer to, uh, you know, the 1860s or 70s prior to the founding of the Second International. Um, but in terms of, you know, posing, you know, the question of a party within DSA, I think that that's correct and that's what, uh, you know, Marx did in, in the workers' movement of his time. Um, and it, it ended up being very successful. They were arguing for the idea of working class independent political action um, against the anarchists who were abstentionist, um, uh, and against, um, you know, those who wanted to be tales of one or the other faction of the ruling class, either uh, the liberals or, um, you know, in the case of LaSalle, of uh, sort of the Bismarckian uh, landed ruling class. Um, and then, you know, in terms of, you know, how can you uh, say that you want unity and yet uh, tell, talk about people being wrong? Um, you want organizational unity, um, but not on lowest common denominator politics and not on uh, the basis of nothing or that we all call each other the left or come out of the left. We want unity on a program for working class rule. And that means engaging with the people who already consider themselves socialists. And when <laughs> they are wrong or when you believe that they're wrong, you make arguments for why they're wrong. To, to win them over to your ideas so that we can uh, be fighting for the same thing and, and we can achieve unity. Um, so that to me uh, is, is pretty straightforward. Um, if there are social imperialists in the left, social imperialism is a bad strategy for the working class movement. It makes it a tale of the ruling class um, and it, it hampers workers' uh, international unity across borders. Those are arguments that you make that, that back up a label like social imperialist. Yeah, on social imperialists, I'm just going to say, uh, we had this discussion with the uh, comrades in the Netherlands. Uh, okay, we, we aren't saying there has to be a split right now, which is what Lenin and Zinoviev said in 1914. Yeah. But we are saying you can't make an agreement to shut up about, say, don't talk about the war. Okay, Basil Fawlty. Don't talk about the war. Yeah, because uh, the Dutch government, which is much smaller scale business involved in this, the Dutch government is proposing to spend the same amount as its whole education budget on arms to Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, the British government is planting stories in the media that rail strikers are animated by support for Putin. 
Yeah. So that the domestic class struggle and the war are not separable from one another in that way. Yeah. Um, and the second point uh, uh, in relation to how far is this relevant to today, my, my answer, I did actually say in my initial presentation, there are recent snowball effects. It's not just that there were snowball effects of the Second International. It's that we've got clear evidence uh, in the 1980s, 1990s, 2000s of snowball effects from uh, unification, even where the unification was on an, what we would regard as being an unsatisfactory basis, and and it winds up being wasted. Um, it winds up being wasted. The Socialist Scottish Socialist Party, in the most ridiculous tragedy, repeated as farce way that uh, they made a cult of the personality of Tommy Sheridan as the guy who was uh, and presented him as a respectable bourgeois politician. And then when it comes out that he uh, 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 has a dodgy sex life, uh, 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 it's totally inconsistent and they collapse and they, uh, uh, they but each of these Nonetheless, before you get to the point of collapse, there's massive progress, rel temporary, very temporary massive progress relative to the regime of uh, uh, groups all saying the same thing with their um, press imitating the tabloid press uh, 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 and uh, presenting as uh, 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 competing groups with the same product. Okay, we, yeah, time for one or two more questions. So Aaron and Ed, I can see. And then I think maybe we'll wrap up because it's pretty, it's the end of the day. Okay, um, thank you very much for your remarks. Um, I wanted to ask about something that came up earlier in the discussion but I think has persisted, which is the question of the Constitution and constitutional reform. Mike, when you first mentioned it, uh, it kind of reactivated like memories from like two or three years ago when that was very current on the US left. Mainly, I think, because people thought that if you just got rid of the Electoral College, then Trump would go away. Um, but it also made me think that I kind of wish that maybe one of uh, you know the SWP comrades was up here discussing with you, because they've all been, I think, very particularly attuned to the crisis of the Constitution in America over the last few years, which is ongoing and really, I mean, we could say it started all the way back with Bush in the Iraq war, um, but certainly it was at issue with Trump, um, it was at issue with the COVID lockdowns, and now it's at issue again with the Ukraine war, um, and can you fund a war that, without actually declaring war, all of these things are a crisis um, of the US Constitution. Um, the question of the franchise and of voting is also historically a question of constitutional crisis, and in the past, it's been resolved um, often in a conservative way. And so there are plenty of examples of a conservative reform of the Constitution or the Constitution being reformed in ways that one might think is OK, but it happens at the behest of and actually in service of a conservative regime. Um, the one that just comes to mind right off the top of my head is Wilson um, and the expansion of the franchise to women in the United States. Um, and I know I grew up in America, but I do know a bit of British history and enough to know about Palmerston and parliamentary Bonapartism um, and the crisis of uh, you know what one may call the British Constitution. I, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. Um, <laughs> and the reform bills and the defeat of chartism and the defeat of liberalism that is in some ways overseen by constitutional reform. Um, so I wanted to ask, because I think it is kind of part of the experience of the left, of the DSA, and of the discontent with the DSA today, um, the attempt to criticize the strategy of the DSA, whether one is seeking um, to have kind of a better electoral strategy, or one wants to say, well, we just need to get rid of electoral strategy. It is this ongoing crisis of constitutional politics, um, not just in America, but worldwide. Um, and so what is the orientation of Marxists uh, towards uh, the crisis of the bourgeois, cons the constitution of the bourgeois republic, or the constitution of bourgeois politics. Thank you. Should, maybe, as an aside to that, I'll just add that Rory asked a couple 
I don't know, 20, 30 minutes ago, what the two panelists think about the American Revolution, just as a aside to Aaron's comment. I'm sorry, did, was there one? Ed? Yeah, my question is also about the Constitution, which I think also issues out of the second part of Ephraim's question about how you relate to capitalist politics. Um, because certainly in, in the Trump era, we have seen a kind of doubling or tripling down on what is in fact a longstanding tendency in progressive capitalist politics to want to erode constitutional foundations of government, right? And if we think about how that is playing out at present in, in American politics, we see that among the working class, for example, there is a much larger, much greater fidelity to things like uh, the First Amendment and the Second Amendment, and are arguably even the separation of powers, than there is among the progressive uh, technocracy, if you will, in and around the DSA and in the Democratic Party. And so I'm wondering, what do you make of this? And in particular, one can look at the program of the old Socialist Party of America, right, and find that indeed they call for changes to the Constitution. One can read their orders critiquing the Constitution, certainly. But a significant difference, it seems to me, is that they, in organizing a mass electoral party as well as a mass civil social movement, were in a position to potentially benefit from and capitalize, capitalize on certain reforms that they were advocating for. Whereas it seems to me that the only force politically that could possibly benefit from greater erosions of constitutional protections today would be the progressive democratic party that Marxist unity group and the DSA are organizing in and around. Um, and so I'm wondering what do you make of that and is there not a significant break between your relationship to the constitution and that of the second international? I can try to answer some of the more US specific things. Um, I find it somewhat bizarre, your counterposing of the working class and the progressive technocracy. Um, I don't know that there is like a unified working class opinion on, on high politics and constitutional issues at, at present because we don't have a working class political movement that's putting out views on those things. On the first and second amendments, um, you know, that's not our critique of the Constitution. I, you know, those are democratic amendments. The Bill of Rights was a democratic um, uh, addition to a tyrannical Constitution um, pushed by the anti-federalists. Um, and as far as, you know, erosions of constitutional protections, I, I don't think that's what we're arguing for either as long, if you mean those protections as in constitutionally guaranteed rights. In arguing against the Constitution, we're arguing against the undemocratic um, arrangement of the state uh, embodied in the Constitution, the imperial independent presidency, the Senate, um, which uh, does not conform to the principle of uh, direct, universal, and equal suffrage, talking about reforms uh, for proportional representation. Uh, these things would electorally benefit the socialist movement. And I, you know, <laughs> I don't think that DSA is in a progressive technocracy that's lording over the ruling class, or that's lording over the working class. Um, you know, I do think uh, that DSA, um, you know, it, it, it's a class collaborationist organization, um, but I do think it's part of the socialist movement. I think it would benefit uh, from political democracy. Um, so it, uh, I just don't buy uh, that the interests of um, the Trump wing of the ruling class um, can be identified with the working class just because, you know, working class people support the First and Second Amendments. Um, I just, I, I don't see uh, the connection there. And I would say that, that Trump is as much part of the ruling class um, as, you know, the progressive Democrats. And we need to break from both and, and uh, put forward um, independent working class politics, a working class constituency with its own um, uh, approach to um, high politics and constitutional issues. And that means attacking uh, the undemocratic features of the constitutional order. The, the socialist movement um, 
you know, it, it was a commonplace to attack bicameralism, to attack presidentialism, um, to attack uh, institutions like the Supreme Court's right of judicial review. Um, these were all breaks on popular power. That's how they were conceived by Madison in the first place. Uh, you know, we can talk about the American Revolution. I think there were democratic currents in it, like Paine. I think there were oligarchic current currents in it, um, like Madison. Um, so, you know, I do think that um, fighting for uh, radical democracy in the state, um, fighting against um, the current constitutional order is a core demand of the socialist movement. Um, and I don't see such uh, historical discontinuity as has been posed in some of the questions. Yeah. Um I guess uh, the one difference I would say is my, my view of, of the, about the judiciary is that the judiciary is not the least dangerous branch. Mm. Um, I think that the judiciary invented out of whole cloth uh, the doctrine of inducing breach of contract, which is the foundation of anti-union laws. Mm. Invented out of whole cloth and against the main current of the precedents before the decisions uh, uh, in the United States and in Britain in the 1880s, 1890s. So that it's delusional to imagine that the judicial branch will protect us. And the same is, of course, true uh, of uh, the uh, judicial supremacy in the European Union. This was part of the reason why we were very unwilling, uh, unlike uh, we CPGP, were very unwilling, unlike... Uh, uh, some of the organizations of the left to say we have to defend the existence of the European Union because it preserves uh, social rights against uh, the, the right wing. But the reality is the Viking and Laval decisions decide that any strike which is for more than the legal minimum wage or for, uh, uh, to defend the right to work no more than the legal maximum working hours is illegal. So that the European Union, because there's a conflict, they say, between the right of the right guaranteed of the right of uh, freedom of membership of trade unions is in the constitution of the European Union. But so is the right of freedom of uh, establishment of businesses. And we have to balance the rights against each other, just as Ronald Dworkin argued, we have to balance rights against each other and so on and so on. So... Um, uh, like Matt, I would be say that the First and Second Amendments are indeed uh, expressions of democratic rights. Um, Article 4 of the Bill of Rights 1689, which uh, guarantees to the Protestant subjects the right to keep and bear arms. Um, I, there is an extraordinarily, I've been following a certain amount of the legal historians debate about the Second Amendment and the extent to which the opponents of uh, the, the, the advocates of gun control, you know, the guys who were protected by the uh, Article 4 of the Bill of Rights 1689 uh, was uh, among other people, one of the aristocrats who had in his house uh, the equipment for two whole regiments of cavalry and two pieces of artillery. Uh, you'd be talking about now the guy who owns uh, fighter aircraft and um, tanks. Um, the right to bear arms, keep and bear arms in that sense is meaning that. So, yeah, um, but that's different from defend the constitutional order. And uh, in Britain, we put a lot of effort into... Uh, addressing constitutional questions about the role of the judiciary, about the role of the House of Lords, about uh, Scots devolution, about um, uh, the structure of the parliament, uh, about uh, corruption in the electoral system, about uh, the uh, electoral commission, which is a body which decides whether you have the right to stand for election under your own name or you have to use some other name. Um, which, surprise, surprise, the CPGP is not allowed to stand for election under its own name, nor is the Socialist Party of England and Wales. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, the constitutional issues are uh, fundamental and important issues. Will the changes, would the sort of changes that we fight for benefit the workers' movement? Yes. 
no hesitation about that. It's the sort of constitutional changes which are designed to increase checks and balances uh, or to uh, increase the judicial power uh, or to increase the uh, power of the bureaucratic state. Those are the ones which uh, are against the interests of the workers' movement. Well, I'm just thankful for uh, having this dialogue. It, it's been great to to talk with people about these uh, questions, and it was um, good to be on this uh, platform with Mike. But that's it. Great. Yeah. Thanks very much.